All you have to know is that Jesus is a healer. All you have to know is that he's compassionate. Bless God, he comes by and he picks you up out of the dirt, out of the pain of your life, and he lifts you up on solid ground. He said, look, I love you. I care about you. I'm the healer. I'm your blesser. I'm your savior. I am the one you've been looking for. Trinity Gospel Temple presents Brother Dave and the Hour of Power Singers. Hello, everybody. The Lord bless you real good. It's so good to be with you today. I don't, it doesn't matter where you are. I just trust the Lord is with you real close, and I'll be praying for you. Stay tuned because we have a great program planned. I'll be preaching a message from God's Word that I believe will inspire your faith. So stay tuned. Let your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Fire fall as we lift you higher. Let your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come. We need your grace. We need your power. You turn to you, our strong tower. Good to have you today. Let's turn and face the cameras. We're going to pray for people around the world, and I know you just love to do it, and so do I. Father, in Jesus' name, we reach out to people everywhere. We know that often there are people who are so lonely, even though they may be amidst others because of the loss of someone very, very dear to them or some loved one. It still seems empty to them. And somehow, Lord, I know that emotionally we're made up that way when we lose somebody dear. But, Lord, you're able somehow to fill that vacancy, that vacuum, that pain that comes from loneliness. Lord, often people are in the midst of a lot of people and still feel totally alone. So I pray for them, especially today, Lord. I ask you to help them. I pray for those who are unsaved. I ask you, Lord, to convict their hearts. 
what a wonderful time of year it would be for them to make their decision for Christ before it's eternally too late. Oh, Lord, for those who at one time were on fire for you, but now they're far from you. Wouldn't it be great, Lord, if we could just see them come and restore their relationship with you, and you restore with them. And I know you are the peace that passes understanding. Father, we pray for all of our friends. We love to do that. Our biker friends, Lord, we just saw a picture. They gave me a picture. One of the elders here from Ohio, one of the elders, biker elders in the state of Ohio, and gave me a picture of them meeting, uh, Lord, in, in, the, in the West, just thousands of them. Lord, a thousand of converted bikers that are spreading the good news across the land. And we pray for their safety. We pray for their effectiveness. We pray for our truckers, Lord, and we know that you're with them. We pray for those on the reservation, Lord. We ask you, so many of them, not only the ones we have, Lord, right there uh, in Wisconsin area, Lord, but also in Oklahoma and other areas in Florida, wherever those reservations are, Lord, many of them are our friends, and we reach out to them and pray for their divine blessing from the, from the Lord. Lord, we pray for the sick today. We reach out to those who are afflicted. Lord, sickness can come on us suddenly and sometimes unawares and just sneaks up on us. But Lord, we pray today that whoever's enduring sickness in their body will find healing in the midst of their storm. How we ask you to lay your hand upon them, someone that feels so alone, so, so detached, and I pray for them, raise them up, which I speak peace into their heart, life and uplift in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we just pray for our nation as a whole. We pray for the spiritual part. All the Christians are lifting up the bloodstained banner. Lord, missionaries around the world, wherever they're doing the work, I ask you to bless them. Bless the persecuted Christians and Jews around the world. It's a horrible thing and hardly talked about, but Lord, we pray for their safety and we pray for their blessing in the name of Jesus. We pray for our government. We pray, Lord, for those who are in charge over us, so to speak, politically at least, and we pray for all the responders here at home. We pray for our sheriff, Lord, and our city police and our state police and our fire and all the responses. We bless them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Which in your name we pray. Everybody said amen.
just tell you this, that the profound, exponential exclusiveness of the church is unprecedented. He didn't say this to anybody else. He said it to us. As the Father has sent me, I send you. You couldn't get higher credentials than that. A denomination can't give you that credential. And any other organization on earth can give you the credential that God alone gives. And he gives the church the highest place. It doesn't mean that a part of the church has not prostituted itself and rewritten the scriptures and are an abomination before God. Even though that's the case, there are millions, tens of millions of people across the earth that still believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God and are part of this fantastic, transcendent thing called the church. Can you say amen? Without question, the, the church, I called it God's refulgent incubator. It's refulgent because you can't get brighter than him. You can't get more resplendent than Jesus. He's the greatest light there is. He is the light of the world. And you can't get any greater than an incubator where people can be born into the kingdom of God because the church is the birthing place. Yes, people get saved all over, but often it's because they heard something in a church or some broadcast from a church somehow or someone from a church testified to them. The church always has a big part to play. I'm talking about the church of the living God to bring them in to where they can hear the gospel and they can grow and have a place where they can commit their life to Christ and feel safe to do so. Don't have to feel if they do that, they're going to be ostracized, going to lose their job over it. Like in some countries, maybe lose your life or making a commitment to Christ. So the church is God's refulgent incubator and it's God's transcendent idea and it's the most heterogeneous because it doesn't leave anybody out. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, whosoever believeth in him. It doesn't limit to a particular race of people. It doesn't limit it to a certain color of people. It doesn't limit it to a, a certain ethnicity or financial position in life or educational position in life. It said whosoever will can come. And we can find hope in the time of despair. And it, it's, it's, it's an amazing organism. You see, it's not dependent upon an earthly organization because if you're in an earthly organization, you've got to pass the mustard. What I mean by that is you have to live by the rules of that organization or you have to pay your dues and pay your fees or whatever it happens to be so that you can be a bona fide member of that earthly organization. But you see, there's no such organization as that. Any earthly organization that calls themselves Christian in the, in, the, in the financial realm or the IRS realm is the 5013C, religious organization. Anyone that calls them that, we are simply a receptacle of what God has given to us. And the best we have to give is what he has given to us. We're not, a, we're not the origination of salvation or the message of truth. We're just the, the receptacle that's received something, and then it's up to us to proclaim it and give it to others so that they can find reality in Christ. So the cap capacious heart of God is so big, it's so, so generous, so kind. I, I often, I don't know how you feel about yourself. I, don't, I, have, I think I have a healthy self-esteem of who I am in Christ, at least a healthy self-worth who I am in Christ. But I can't help it. Many times when I get real sincere with God and I'm having my prayer with him, I say, Lord, thank you for having patience on me. Thank you for caring enough about me that even when I am not adequate and I can't do what I wish I could do, I can't give you what I wish I could give you. I wish I had more ounces. I don't mean just weight, <laughs> physical weight, but I wish I had more to give to him because he means so much to me, and I mean this with all my, my heart. But the capacious heart of God and his scintillating love, there's nothing like it in the world. No human can give you the love that Christ offers. It's just absolutely amazing. It's mind-blowing because, you know, when you really analyze it, no matter how good of a person you are, you know you, you don't deserve it. 
You're not good enough. You never could be good enough. You can't do enough good things. You can't earn enough money. You can't give enough money. You can't do enough benevolent deeds to ever earn or deserve the love of God. And that's what makes it so precious to me because I realize how great he is. And the church has a plethora of opportunities. See, the church has a responsibility. So I'm getting to it. Some of you will get uncomfortable, but... Uh, we can let you just act like you're not uncomfortable. We probably won't know it. You'll know it. But there's a plethora of opportunity to step up to the plate and stand for righteousness or right living. And I have to say to you that it's an embarrassment to me that a big portion of the church does not have the nerve, the unmitigated nerve to tell the truth of what the Bible teaches. Because they're so fearful that they will lose their prestige in the community or they may lose people out of their congregation. And they were more, they're more concerned about the finance that comes in from the people or that circumstance than they are of pleasing God. And it's an abomination because we're the only hope. If the church blunts its message, what is the world going to hear? It's going to hear a skewed contaminated some sort of a message. You know the trouble the, cult, the culture is in. I don't need to tell you. I don't want to just dwell on that. But it'd be, it would be folly for us not to realize that our culture is in very serious moral shape. We are morally in very bad shape. But we can stand up for righteousness, and if we did that, we could chart the future of our country. For many years, we talk about when we get the right people on the Supreme Court, for instance, depending on what side of the aisle you are on or what, how you feel about conservatism or liberalism. You know, that's between you and God. But I mean, at least they say, no matter who it is, but if, if you get the people on the Supreme Court that favors where, where you're at, it can be, that'll determine it for the country for sometimes 30 and 40 years because people don't ever leave the Supreme Court unless they die. A few people retire, but generally they stay to operate. You think about some on the Supreme Court now. There are some in their 80s like Brian, Brian and some others that are on the court. But we think about the influence that the court will have on society for years to come. Well, think about the, the influence the church has on society if it would take its rightful place. And so we could stand up for righteousness if we would. And I'm talking about like abortion on demand. See, you get a young couple. Now, you know why messages like this won't be preached with I'm going to refer to today? Because almost everybody in any size gener congregation has somebody, has a child, has, a, has somebody in their family, a friend that they know, somebody they work with or what, that fits under this position so we're afraid of offending them. But here's the thing, sin is not unpardonable. But not to recognize it is ridiculous because if you don't recognize sin and you don't handle what it requires of repentance and have God's forgiveness, it can damn you eternally to hell. I told you this wouldn't be popular. I don't expect you to get, give me a hand here. And how about homosexuality and lesbianism? My Lord, one of the large churches in the country just had not one lesbian become the pastor, but they had two lesbians come in who are married to each other and became co-pastors of their church. Now, if the church does not stand up for things like this, now why will we? I'm going to show you why we have the right and the responsibility of standing up and calling sin, sin. It don't matter if it affects me, it affects you, your family. It doesn't make any difference. Sin still remains sin. And it must be dealt with. If people don't understand that even though the culture accepts it, doesn't mean that it's acceptable by God. So if we understand that, then we're going to do something about it. I want you to go to with me to the book of Romans. I think I done this once before to you, but I'm in the book of Romans. Let me read some verses to you so you know I'm not making this up. I'm not biased. I'm not prejudiced toward anybody that has a different sexual orientation or, or whatever else they may do that's odd, what I consider outside of the bonds of Scripture. But let's just read about some of the things it says here. 
For instance, it says in verse 22, I'm in, I'm in Romans, I'm not even in, 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 I'm not in Ezekiel, I mean Ecclesiastes, where a lot of this is dealt with. They say, well, that's Old Testament. I'm not in the Old Testament, just for you folks that are really strict about that. Let's go to the New Testament. Here it says in verse 22, it says, professing to be wise, they became fools. Let me tell you why. And they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like incorruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. First, it starts out on these false religions that have idols that they worship. And it says, and change the glory of the incorruptible God. Then verse 24, therefore God gave them up. Listen, if that's your choice, God will give you up and let you do it. Do your thing and enjoy it while you're doing it because it won't be long until you be cut off. You didn't want to hear that, but I thought I'd tell you anyhow. God gave them up to uncleanness, to the lust of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves. So God sets the stage here. And he says, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. We're more concerned about, hey, different strokes for different folks. What feels good to you? That's not the point here. We're serving a creator, not the creature. Help Brother Dave here because he's trying hard here. And then in verse 26, he says, for this cause, God gave them up. God will give you up. Say, hey, this is the way I want, this is what I enjoy life. This is the best I have gone for me. I'm not giving it up. Your choice, your privilege. And he said, this reason, God gave them up to their own passions for even their women, now watch it, homosexuals and lesbians, even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men didn't leave them out, leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful, receiving in, the, in themselves the penalty that it, uh, and, uh, that penalty of their error, which was due. Can't blame God. He warns us about it. And let me tell you the company you hold. If you're a homosexual, you're a lesbian, you believe in same-sex marriage, you believe in committing adultery, you believe in having sex outside of marriage, let me tell you the crowd that you fit in with, just so you know. So, you know, birds of a feather, you want to, you want to know this. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind. He's still describing this style of life. To a debased mind, to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness. Now watch what he does. He puts you in this category. Sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, and whispers, backbiters, haters of God, putting you in that category. You say, well, I, just because I have a different sexual orientation, I don't, I'm not none of that. I know, but you're in that crowd. <laughs> Excuse me for interfering in your life. Evil minus, and whispers, what I say, backbiters, and evil things, disobedient to parents, all this apart, Un, undeserving, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. I'm still struggling with these eyeballs. I, I could have got my old porn rim glasses out, but I forgot where they are. But anyhow, now watch. Who knowing the righteous judgment of God and those who practice such things are worthy of death. Not only to do the same, but they also approve others that do it. That's the strange thing about it. That's how pornography is so popular. 450,000 sites across the world, pornography. And I hate to give you the percentage. I don't have it right off, so I don't want to stretch it, but there's a high percentage of men, and we used to be men now, men and women, that are hooked on pornography. We talk about being hooked on drugs, being hooked on pornography. See, the problem with pornography, it presents something that's not realistic. It pre presents a sexuality that's so out of bounds with reality that people that get hooked on that expect that they're going to find that in real life too blunt for you. I thought I'd share that with you just in case. 
But that's just the start of it. What, well, how did I begin in all this tirade? I began by saying the church has the opportunity to present righteousness. How can people know what is right if we never teach them from the Bible what is right? It's not that we, I don't, I don't treat them different. In my ministry, over the course of years, as you know, and I tell you how many years all the time, but it's been a long time, decades of years, I've buried, I, mean, I conducted the, 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 the message for the, for the funeral of seven homosexuals that died of AIDS. So it's not that I'm against them. I love them as a person. I love lesbians as people. I love people that are in adultery as people. But except ye be born again, you shall not see the kingdom of God. Now, that's just the beginning. We're talking about the morality part of it. How about people that are struggling to get one nation under God out of our pledge? They don't want us to mention God. They don't want to hear it. And it goes on and on. Prayer in the school, you dare not be a star, even if you're the star quarterback or the star lady, uh, whatever, what you, what you, soccer, or whatever it was, and, you're the, and you get a chance to give the, the, the prayer at, at the commencement exercises. You dare not bring up Jesus. And you know that they're told ahead of time that if they do, they'll be cut, the microphone will be cut. It's only a few years ago, folks, it was only in the early 80s when McKinley Bulldogs won two state basketball, I believe it was basketball, two, two, two years in a row, and they asked Brother Dave to come and give the prayer. They would no more ask me to give the prayer in today's world than to ask the man in the moon to come and give the prayer. I still have the prayer. I looked in my old drawer the other day, and I was looking there and have a prayer. I really wrote out. Things change, don't they, folks? But the Ten Commandments, we treat them like they're ten suggestions. <laughs> we must unde unde you know, unashamedly declare once again that America is a Christian nation with Judeo, Judeo roots. Yeah. It doesn't matter how many heathen and atheists and people that come in from any other place in the world. I dare you to once again go back and look at the founders, read about the founders, who they were, what they believed, how the, the country was established in the first place, and you'd find that it was built upon Judeo-Christian roots, and that's the way it ought to continue. Now, like in the book of Esther, when Esther had to remind her uncle, I believe it was, Mordecai, that Mordecai, they're trying to get rid of all the Jews. They're trying to kill them. And she was a Jew, but she had found favor because the king had married her and she had favor in the king's court. She made a very interesting statement. When the chips were down and the rubber met the road, she said, who knoweth but what thou hast come to the kingdom for such an hour as this. Martin Luther King, when he came across the country and across the world and made such an impact for a very worthy cause. And a great saying became developed within, within the group. And you begin to hear him say, if not us, who? If not now, when? And I say to the church, rise up from your ap apathy and lethargy and say, if not us, who then? Who's going to do it? If not now, when? After millions and millions go to hell to serve an eternity in hell because they did not hear the truth. I believe sometimes I feel I'm a watchman. And that's why I never get discouraged. I want people to come physically to the altar every time I conduct an altar call. <clears throat> but if one person in the world or outside of this church or in the church, wherever they may be, hears the truth, and somehow I can influence them to receive Christ. It's like gaining the whole world. Amen. Can you say amen today? Amen. Who knows but what you have come to the kingdom for such an hour as this. God has positioned us in this event flower to use our influence to affect the future of the planet. Can you imagine that? We're going to affect the lives of billions of people 
There are going, pretty soon it'll be 7 billion people in the world. That's a lot of billions. And who knows if with the spreading of the gospel, with God making available the, the ability to get the gospel around the world. We, we used to dream about stuff like that. When I was young, coming up in the church, I remember people often said, oh, we got to reach the world. They kept talking about reaching the world. It seemed physically impossible to do so at the time. Each one little church, whether it was large or big, in those days if you had 100, and 100 you know, regular attendants, that was good, or 300, my, you was getting up, if you had 500, you was considered a large church. But even today with the mega churches, some... I believe in uh, Joel Osteen's church, they claim they've, they've, they've ministered over their several services on Sunday to over 50,000 people. But even so, when you compare it with the masses, it's just simple, a small contingency, if it, as it were. But if all of us would become one, if all of the evangelists would become, see, we proved that even in voting. Now, you may not agree. Please understand, when I do this, I'm not trying to prove. I, I'm just telling you the facts. That's all I'm telling you. I'm not trying to persuade you. It's up to you. You're human. You can make any decision you want. I'm not talking about what decision you make. I'm just saying when the evangelicals get together as a voting block, they can vote a person in. That's how powerful they are because there are thousands and hundreds of thousands of votes. Well, think of that. Now, that may be in your, you know, protocol or not, but, but imagine what we could do, though, if we could use that influence for the cause of Christ. What if the church got together and unashamedly did things together, not just be separate in separate boxes all the time? That has to be for a lot of reasons. But we ought to have at least times when we can expand ourselves and take other Christians by the hand and say, hey, we got a fight on our hands. We've got to work together or we're, we're going to go down together. I, I, I didn't think it would be real popular today, but I, thought, I just thought I'd preach it in the end. God's refulgent incubator. I'm in favor of it. I think it's great that the church exists, and I, well, I'm glad I'm a part of it in the name of the Lord. Look at Psalm 34 and 15. See if you get some. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, not the unrighteous. The curse is upon the unrighteous. Now, he offers salvation. He offers grace. But you have to take advantage of it. You have to be born again. You have to do something about it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. You know, I don't know. I'll probably get stoned for this because I, I don't have any, any, any particular reason to say this other than and don't you kind of feel it's a little bit strange that this year, if you would analyze it compared to any other year, has been one of the most, cat cant what do I want to say, catastrophe, catastrophe. I don't know if you can use the word catastrophe, and I don't think so, that don't sound right. It, 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 it's been a, been a year that's filled with more catastrophe, how about that, than any other year. Think about the hurricanes, the floods that happened, greatest ever, some hitting back to back, flooding out people, killing people. Puerto Rico, we, we, we forget about them. They'll never recover, never. It's that bad. It, the, 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 it was wiped out practically. Still don't have power in most of the, of the nation except for uh, little uh, emergency kind of power that they might have. And then the fires of California. Unprecedented. Thousands upon thousands of structures and homes, and even Ophir Winfrey's area where they live in the higher, even there, some of their homes got damaged. Do you wonder? Now, listen, God doesn't cause that. But let me just tell you what could happen. God has his hand on America because from the years back, for all we've done, we've been a good country. We've helped many, and we've freed we freed England and France, and they don't forget about it. Every so often they remember. If you ever saw some of the pictures of the destruction that came when the Blitzkrieg came from the Germans and, and those London was destroyed beyond imagination, all real built now. But God knows that America came, and it was there even when it wasn't in. And right today, you know, there are democratized countries such as Germany, for instance. East Germany became united with West Germany. 
and now live as a democracy. How about Japan? Japan is now a democracy. So God knows the goodness of America, and he's blessed us. But could it be possible that we could, we could tip the penland by going too far away from him and on our own and more sinful and just farther away from him and less and less people going to church and all that? And could it be possible that God just takes his hand off? He don't have to cause it if he takes his hand of blessing and protection off. Oh, my. I didn't think it'd be. See, I didn't, this is not meant to be a popular sermon. I just want to tell you the truth. But let's look at Psalms 33 and 12 and see what the Bible says can happen to our nation. Blessed, preferred is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. The nation can be blessed, folks, but you and I, must have the unmitigated nerve to stand up no matter what the cost and not be ashamed no matter where you work, no matter what you do in life, to say, I am a born-again believer and I advise you to do the same. <laughs> God has blessed America materially, spiritually, and politically like no other nation in history. The psalmist David said, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And that's what I want. I want his blessing. As we pray for God's continued blessings on America for this 21st century, we, may, we, we, we are made to, to believe that the promise that God made to Abraham is applicable to us. Let's go to Genesis chapter 12, verse number 2. And here's what he says to Abraham. He said, I will make you a great nation... I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Now go to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29. You may get that real quick, Galatians 3, verse 29. Let me show you why that promise is important to us. And if, hallelujah, if you are Christ. If you're unashamed to say, I am born again, I've been washed in the blood, I may not be perfect, but I'm doing everything in my power to ask God's help so that I can live a more righteous life and not continue in a life that I used to live. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That's how we get into that greatness business. You can't be great without God's blessing. Every kingdom that ever came up in history, if you just examine some of them in history, you'll find that they always dis dissipated and di were destroyed because of immorality. Because they always forgot the God of heaven and earth. And we dare not do that. It's very dangerous. So we're, we are made like Abraham to believe that this blessing applies to all nations throughout history. More than two decades ago, Soviet dissident Alexander Solzhenitsyn warned Congress, even though he saw the fallacy of communism, but he warned Congress when he was here in America. He said, very soon, only too soon, your country will require not exceptional men, but great men. Find them in your souls. Find them in your heart. Find them in the depth of your country. Because he knew what could happen. He, he knew history. What our alien nation needs now is great men and women who will rise to the challenge of the day, who will give us hope based on real truth, not empty promises. Are you listening today? But men and women with godly character. And what we've seen in the last two or three weeks almost causes your breath to, to leave you. When you think about our country in the hands of people that we can't even trust, not only in the Congress and the Senate, and we've had accusation in the presidency as well, but how about in the FBI? Whoever heard of it in the upper echelons of the FBI being questioned because of their moral positions and their bias? I tell you, folks, we don't realize how dangerous ground we're on. And unless something happens to change the, the, you know, there is a tide in the affairs of men which taken at the, fort, which taken at the, at the, whatever that is, it leads on to fortune. It's been a long time it just since I did that quote. 
But there also is a tide in the affairs of man that leads to destruction, and great is the destruction thereof. Wow, I think I'm going to go out the back door. If, if you don't see me in the front, get, start the car, honey. Get it running and running. Just <laughs> make a fa fast exit. But principles that lead us back to the blessings of God, that's what I want. Yeah. Now is the time to live in the spirit of our revolutionary founders who gave everything they had. Did you ever read about our founders? Today it's not even popular to teach it. I wonder sometimes why people are coming out of colleges with mush for brains. Well, it's true. If you don't know these truths and you only know something else, then if, you, if, you, if what you know is, is in opposition to what's taught in this word, I guarantee you in the long run, you will lose. There's no way to win with that. Gave everything they had for the cause of Christ's liberty. Patrick Henry, for instance, said this. They tell us that we are weak unable to cope with so formidable an adversary. Sir, we are not weak. If we make proper use of the means which God has placed in our power, that's the kind of founders I'm talking about. We can also be inspired by the great phrase that I said already was spawned during the civil rights. If not us, then who? I want to know who else can do it. If not now, when? Praise God. There's got to be a revival of righteousness and a renewed commitment from Christ's followers in America. We can complete our mission if we can. We will succeed when we return to America's original purpose, one nation under God, and they want to take it out of the pledge. Help me, Jesus. One dear lady that watches Brother Dave, she's a Catholic and never been in a Protestant church in her life, but just because she knows me, she watches me. So she was describing me to someone the other day, and that someone told me about this older lady telling her. Said, she said, I watched Brother Dave. He's like a jumping jack. <laughs> She's not used to any movement. You know, she used to. Yes, uh, Are you still with Brother Dave? Shall I continue? So not only that, but the Puritans who arrived on our shores after the pilgrims, also made a covenant with God. This goes back a long way, folks. We didn't just make this up in our garage. They made a covenant with God. Their leader, John Winthrop, he wrote these stirring words. We shall be as a city on a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us so that if we shall deal f falsely with our God in this work that we've undertaken and so cause him to withdraw his presence from us, God help us, we shall be made a story and a byword throughout the world. He's called us to be the light of the world. And yet he warns that if we stray away from what he has taught, it's very dangerous. The city on a hill is a powerful image, by the way. It's not, didn't originate with man. It originated in the Bible, given by Jesus in Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse 14. You are the light of the world. And a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Did you notice that Trinity Gospel Temple is not on flat land? If you just follow it up, you'll notice it's a little uphill. And the church sits at the top of the hill. Hallelujah. A city on a hill is the light of the world. Are you still with Brother Dave? This is really good stuff here today. I'm telling you, it's a good stuff. It's a powerful image. This represents the duty each believer has to shine his light. And the Bible says if our light no longer shines, how can we show people the way? If the salt has lost its savor, how can we be an influence? How can we be an influence to, to, the, to the meal people are eating? We're the ones that flavor the meal. Not just when we cook at home and how much salt, garlic salt or garlic powder or how much whatever you put in there to get it to say so much. You are the light of the world. I'm looking at you. You're the salt of the earth. I'm looking at you. You're looking at six. Well, he's not six foot, but he looks, he's, he wish he was. I got enough long arms and long hands and big feet to be six foot five, but I don't know. Somewhere, somewhere I got shorted. I don't remember where it is. No, it's between the legs or somewhere. But I'm glad I am who I am. Like Popeye said, I'm Popeye the sailor man. Praise God. 
So that's the duty of every human being that's called to be, called to be a Christian. The future of America will be to determine by whether we stand on the principles of the Bible. And the writers of the Chronicles, probably Isaiah and Ezra, I'm not sure for, for sure, but they spell out the condition. Let's look at it in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. We'll begin with 14. I want you to read with me because you ought to get this in your craw. You ought to get it. If that's conditional. This greasy grace folk will not stand up to biblical teaching. You can make people feel as comfortable as you want to, but if they're not living according to the scriptures, they, they have false comfort. If, that's a condition, my people who are called by my name, read with me, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Let's go to the 19th. We'll read 19 through the end. If you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, don't forget in the New Testament, we're not living by the commandments of the Old Testament, but we taught it in the other, the other Sunday that we're living under the commandments of Jesus. Jesus gave his own commandments in the New Testament. He did bring nine of the Ten Commandments into the new, the new contract that he made with us. The only one he didn't bring in is the Sabbath, and people can scream at me forever why we don't meet on the Sabbath day. The Bible says you really err because you consider it one day greater than another. You could really worship God any day, Monday, Tuesday. It's just convenient for us to do it on Sunday. So take that for what it, what it, what it says. If you turn away, forsake my, my commandments, which I've set before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, <clears throat> Then, see, then, another conditional word, I will uproot them from my land which I have given them, and this house which I have sanctified for my name, I will cast out of my sight and will make it a proverb and a byword. Sounds like what Matthew just said. A byword among all peoples. Let's, let's read on. And as for this house, which is exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and say, why has the Lord done this to this land and this house? There's been many a kingdom look back and say, why did God allow this to happen? Instead of taking an inventory of the truth, they just deceive themselves. And they will answer, because they forsook the Lord. There's the truth of it of their fathers who brought them out of the land of Egypt and embraced other gods and worshiped them and served them. Therefore, he has brought all this calamity on us. So is it possible that God can lift his hand and we could suffer the results of it? As we face these critical days, we should pray for God's wisdom. And I do this greater than I ever did in my life. You'd think after this many years of doing this, I'd feel like an old pro, be comfortable in what I know. And, and just go about my business and be relaxed. But I can't do that because I know we live in critical times. And if I ever believe God, if I've ever sought him, I'm seeking him now like I've never sought him before because I believe that we're near the end. I really do believe we're near the end. And we should pray for God's wisdom. Noah Webster, you know, you remember the dictionary, we taught Webster's Dictionary. He said this, let it be impressed on your mind that God commands you to choose for rulers, just men and ladies in these days, and will rule with the fear of God. The preservation of a government depends on the faithful discharge of this duty. Should we watch who we vote for? Should we even local candidates and so forth, should we kind of do some research before we start voting for them? See a little bit where, they are, where they're at spiritually? Uh, I didn't think they'd be very popular, I'm telling you. Billy Graham said, if America is to survive, we must elect more God-centered men and women to public office, individuals who will seek divine guidance in the affairs of the state. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, we're being called to duty. Some of you have been in the army of the Lord for a long time and you've become a little lax. You forgot your orders. Well, God's restating the orders to you. Let's get to work. We've got a lot to do. Brother Dave would be blessed to hear from you this week. Please call toll-free 877-453-2519 or locally 330-453-2519. Our address is TGT Mail at TrinityBrotherDave.org or Brother Dave, 
P.O. Box 20029, Canton, Ohio 44701. When you're in the Canton area, we invite you to visit Trinity Gospel Temple at 1612 West Tuscarawa Street, just off I-77. Or visit us online at www.trinitybrotherdave.org. Praise God. I believe you've been enjoying the program as I have. I always uh, enjoy preaching the gospel, and I know that when the gospel is preached, the anointing rises because it's the Word of God that is supernaturally reacts in us when we believe that miracles can happen. And today I want to pray for you. But I was thinking today that so many of you are good people. You're not against God, and you even go to church occasionally, but you've never taken the time to receive Jesus Christ as Lord of your life. I can't urge you enough to do this. The only hope you really have of going to heaven and living eternally is to, to receive Jesus as Lord of your life. The Bible says, he that believeth is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already. So why don't you take the time and trust Brother Dave. Just join me in a prayer. Just repeat it. As I pray it, you repeat with me. And I trust the Lord that something great is going to happen today. Will you do that? Let's pray the prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, that's it. Just repeat after me. I come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I'm so sorry I've disobeyed you in any way. Come into my heart. Save my soul. I hereby now receive you, Jesus as Lord and Savior of my life. Amen. That is great. Now I'm going to pray for you. Father, seal these confessions of faith. May they never doubt what's happened to them. And I pray that they'll get in a good Bible-believing church or else continue to watch this program so that we can feed them the Word of God so they can grow in the Lord. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. So good to have you. I'm so glad that you tuned us in today. I have to go. Time goes so fast. But I want to tell you something. You really don't have any trouble. All you need is faith in God because faith in God moves mighty mountains. And another thing, the Lord has blessed us real good. Amen.